good morning. Uh, welcome to our uh, Building Dedication Symposium. Uh, in a moment, I'll uh, introduce uh, our symposium uh, moderator, Mr. Nathaniel Owings, and he in turn will introduce uh, the panel and kick off uh, the presentations and discussions. A uh, couple announcements. Uh, first, uh, a procedural uh, announcement. I'm sure that a number of you would wish to ask questions of the panel. Uh, to that end, we will have some uh, paper and pencil for you outside uh, for you to uh, write down your questions uh, after the intermission. And uh, if you would pass these to uh, one of the ushers, we can get them to Mr. Uh, Owings for his uh, disposition. The other uh, announcement is, uh, is not so routine. Uh, Romano Jurgla, who was to have been on our panel, will not be here. Uh, we learned, uh, and he learned, early this week that he had to enter the hospital for uh, a major surgery. Uh, we understand he's uh, recovering, and uh, we wish him well. Uh, if I were to uh, attempt to introduce uh, Nathaniel Owings by uh, citing the accomplishments of him or his firm, uh, I'd finish probably just in time for, uh, for lunch. Um, I won't do that. I'll simply say that he's the uh, uh, founding partner of uh, Skidmore, Owings & Merrill. Uh, this firm has acquired uh, a reputation uh, of such uh, national, international stature that uh, no one any longer uses the full name, it's simply SOM. Uh, Mr. Owings is an internationally recognized architect, planner, preservationist, environmentalist. He's an author and I understand most recently a poet. He's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Uh, just over four months ago he, was, uh, he received that institute's uh, most prestigious award, the uh, AIA, AIA Gold Medal. That's the most recent in uh, a long list of honors and awards. And we note with uh, a, no small measure of pride that he's a Hoosier native, and he was the first person uh, that this college recommended uh, to the university for an honorary degree, a degree which is awarded in 1970. Mr. Nathaniel Owens. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very important occasion for you. You're going to be hearing from some very important people in the world, and uh, it's a great experience at your age to have the opportunity to see them, listen to them, and then go back and study their books and their papers. And uh, through the triple experience, <clears throat> it'll help you all the rest of your life. So, <clears throat> Ball State University has brought to you here some extremely distinguished men in their field, and I'm so happy and proud to be able to be involved in it myself. So, it's important. I'm not going to introduce uh, them except to say that if you want to find out more about Paul Freeberg, read the part uh, in the program. I've known Paul a long time. The last and one of the most exciting projects that I, he and I have been involved in is Washington, D.C. on in the Western Plaza. We have a, a little uh, jewel uh, there uh, dedicated to Pershing, General Pershing, but really is dedicated to an ice skating rink where the kids can have a lot of fun all winter long and uh, where it'll become a place of joie de vivre instead of a traffic snarl. Paul has made that into that jewel, and when you come to Washington, I want you to take a look at it. Paul is a, a good man in every sense of the word. He's passionate, he's, know, he's knowledgeable, and now you're going to hear from him. Paul.
Thank you, Nat. That's the kind of an introduction that my mother would believe my father would just understand. You know? <clears throat> well, paradoxically, the older I get, the less I find I have to say. I remember back when I was 30, boy, I really had a lot to say. I mean, I knew exactly what was happening and what to tell you. Then I got to be 40, and I thought I might be able to relate to what might happen, what might be. And now that I'm sort of entering into uh, the 50s, I really can't tell you anything other than what I do. And that, and the implication of that, and that really relates only to the moment at which it's done, because change occurs so rapidly. I grew up in the 50s, actually the 40s and the 50s. And the challenge in those days was really just to survive, to make a living. I'm raising two boys who are supposedly entering into the real world, which I assume means that we're not in the real world. And they're not really so concerned with survival as I was. They're concerned with something else, which is called satisfaction. One is going into uh, the art field, once they become an artist, and the other wants to become a musician. I mean, these are both high-risk vocations. I'm wondering who's going to take care of me when I get older, I mean, with, <laughs> with this approach. But uh, I'll take care of <laughs> that will take care of me. Anyway, the, the point is, is that I think as I look back at what they're doing, I think, although I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraging, I seem to be much more conservative. And I'm not sure whether it's my age or if it's the age that we're living in. I was at a cocktail party the other night, and some lady was telling me that she was going to try virginity again, much to the consternation of her boyfriend, you know. So rather than try to predict the future tonight, which is, or today, rather, what I'd like to do is relate a recent experience that I went through that I think gives out some signals which talk about the, what the challenges of the future might be. In the past few years, I seem to be on the jury circuit. I seem to have been on the jury circuit. I've been to seven in all in the last two years, one in, in Los Angeles, Portland, Oregon, and Portland, Maine. And you always go to these, and you're rather optimistic that you're going to find the answer. You don't quite know what the answer is, but you sort of feel that when you find it, you'll know. Well, now, after this experience, I'm not so sure that juries and competitions give you answers, but they have to, I think evolved into very interesting platforms for offering questions and to formulate questions. Now, I don't like to, to, to get involved with post-mortems. They have a sort of an aura of the macabre in them. Yet this last one, the Parc Villette in Paris, uh, left such an afterimage with me and others that uh, I think it bears a lot more investigations. Now, competitions are like sports events. I mean, there are winners and losers. Except the difference is, is that design is a very subjective field. So the winners are not as clearly defined as you would find in a sports event. Because second and third parties, with their biases and their values, are judging the results of others. And you rarely have a winner. What you have is generally, through this process of selection, is the one who loses the least wins. Now, Villette was a competition for a, a park on an old slaughterhouse site in Paris. Baron Hausmann designed this thing about 100 years ago, and uh, it no longer functions as a slaughterhouse. And the challenge that the French proposed to the design community, the international design community, was to define <coughs> the urban park of the 21st century. And within that, was it was an implied charge to define the role of the landscape architect and the architect within the urban environment. Now, I hadn't been in Paris in about 20 years, and uh, it was a rainy day, like it always is in Paris, when I got to this site. And this was a slaughterhouse site, and I was really amazed, because what I encountered first was this beautiful, elegant, shed-like structure called the Grand Hall. And in the forecourt was a cobbled uh, air plaza with a fountain. And then as you move through the site further, there was a canal and then a large contemporary building that was being, uh, that was the old slaughterhouse and uh, was being turned into their science museum. 
Well, the competition was held in a temporary air-inflated structure that made me feel like I was walking into the mouth of a hairless caterpillar, you know. And inside of this thing, traversing the walls were really hundreds of panels, all the same size, because that was, that was the prerequisite. And like the sports event, what you felt was, you know, the anticipation and excitement that precedes the event itself when the, when the team first goes out on the field. And somewhere in this endless array of panels, you know, of submissions of over 400 uh, architects, landscape architects and artists, you know, you sort of felt that there had to be the answer. You know, this wasn't a, a collective sort of global, you know, a collection of global thought. It was more the individual expression and idea of their own attitudes of what the urban park might be. And you would hope that that would come from historical precedents, married or compared or in related to the contemporary pressures. Well, after the, the first pleasantries of, of introduction and a tour of the site and what was endless, endless orientation periods. I think the French have a fetish for orientation. You know, the judging began. And with this then became the various scenarios that I saw that were going to be played out here beside just the judging itself. And these scenarios, in a way, I think, define in the, the, uh, the differences in the different professions and their, and their values. You know, first you had the endless sparring for power, or the, the mindless sparring for power. The jury was made up of architects, landscape architects, artists, and, and lay people, administrators, and so forth. However, Villette was a competition for a park, and therefore, ergo, the landscape architect felt that they should be in charge or at the very least become, you know, have their member uh, as the, the chairman. You know, and, and so it was. Burley Marx became the chairman. Well, and uh, it was really irrelevant because the two vice chairmen, an artist and an art historian, really ran the procedures. It was equally irrelevant who was in charge because in the determination of the morphology of the urban park, you would in fact define or redefine, you know, where the responsibility was to be vested. Now, urban is the pivotal word here, okay? Because, uh, and then later, by the way, the pivotal word, because it was also joined with the 21st century. Now, you might say that, you know, looking for the park of the 21st century today might be just a little premature because we continue today, excuse me, yeah. we continue today to embrace the 19th century form of park. Now, I don't know whether this implies that, the, uh, that, that we have been unable to find the morphological expression of the present, or that we're just saying that the past is really good enough, and that the natural uh, landscapes, uh, the romantic picturesque designs of Repton, Brown, and Olmsted continue to nurture you know, the spirit of body and provide comfort and solace, and they give us simplicity and grandeur. Uh, you know, now as it has for the past 200 years. Moreover, what was interesting is that everyone on the jury, you know, really understood that and was sympath sympathetic to this meaning of park as defined by the 19th century. Okay, so then why not leave well enough alone? I mean, here everyone's happy, seems to be happy with this. You know, why a competition that would search for answers for a time that we haven't even reached yet? Well, simply put, the uh, parks of Paris, or we were told anyway, that the parks of Paris, Paris were losing their constituency. Therefore, you could conclude that although the romantic natural parks are emotionally appealing, remain our primary point of contact with nature in cities, that in their present form, they're not really fulfilling contemporary needs. Okay, if the lost consti constituency is the, is the symptom, then what's the cause? You know, why aren't they popular today? To whom have we lost the, new, the need for contact with nature in cities? That is, nature as an artifact, carefully encased, you know, and framed, protected, and disconnected from its urban surrounds. You know, and if so, what then is our current relationship to nature? Is it suburbia, or is it the rainforest of ficus and chefalarias that you find in shopping centers? You know, what's going to take the place of the park? Well, ironically, and paradoxically, we have more leisure time in the 20th century now than we've had in the, than we had in the 19th century. We've got almost double the amount of leisure time. So then the question is, where do we spend it? How? Well, I'm not so much going to go into that, the causality of that at this point. However, the apparent shift in the urban and social pattern 
has uh, a, had a dramatic implication on all the environmental designers. And identifying these shifts, I suspect, is the real issue of this competition. Now, opening up the question of urban park morphology suggests that there might be alternatives to the 19th century model. Now, this could and did, in fact, rock the establishment of the landscape, you know, of the landscape architecture. You know, they have heavily, they, we, have heavily vested uh, our interest in this traditional type of park. And any change or implied change would also imply a uh, possible retraining and a reevaluation of values and methods. So with no intention of patronizing my profession, the prevailing, prevailing bias to perpetuate parks you know, as a remnant of a natural artifact, you know, assisted you know, by uh, God, assisted by the landscape architect, you know, as a separate retreat from the city, I suspect was an irrelevant bit of criteria, the fact that disuse or use uh, was a problem. That was irrelevant because the cities really, by definition, need lungs and uh, where by returning to the source of life, urbanites could find solace and spiritual nourishment you know, from the harsh burdens of urban life, which is a fundamental anti-urban notion. And the 19th century construct of the romantic, idyllic greensward, seemingly free from the coercive, domineering influences of geometric order, convey a simple grandeur that is indelibly printed in everyone's vocabulary of images. And it's like a knee-jerk reaction. It's like God and motherhood. Now, ironically, and as an aside, the 18th century France, with its metaphorical power garden, prompted the evolution of garden design into this romantic form. And here was France, you know, the, the, the source of the, the indirect source of this garden form, asking, and park form, asking for us to anal analyze and evaluate a newer form that would take its place. Well, everyone seeks answers by what they know, or primarily what they know, through their own experience. So each, each discipline, in fact, sort of predetermines its product. And as the landscape architect sought to preserve the park in its natural form, uh, the architect enthusiastically embraced the idea of a new urban park morphology. But traditionally, they considered the city their domain. They created it. You know. And without premeditation or plan, they saw this as an opportunity to regain a piece of the environment that had sort of fallen into, into limbo. Now, their historical references were not uh, parks, open spaces, uh, or, uh, or other types of open spaces, except possibly the plaza. And their sort of value-laden biases, which are created by the process of technology, of architectural design, forged ahead, they forged ahead, leaning heavily on structure, process, and method. Now, if you were to codify the, the, the different submissions, you could recognize these biases within the designs themselves. You either had a building, or you had a romantic woods. And if by chance you had a collaboration, you had a building near a romantic woods. And then, now just to give you some of the other typologies that occurred within this, because uh, they, they did in fact fall into groups. One was the design imperative. I do what I know how to do best, and that's make forms. And this approach suggests that by mucking around within the entrails of new and bigger forms, you'd find the solution. Another uh, paradigm was a return to the 60s. Now here, these designers resurrected so these wrinkled, aging people from the 60s, the flower children, and the designs indicated through the imagery that they projected, uh, people dancing in the meadows, planting flowers in gardens, lighting bonfires, and sort of creating these artificial, ephemeral communities. Now the next paradigm was the order is understandable and then desirable. And therefore, you saw designs of parks with grids laid over them to give them order and structure. And the architects, to a large extent, that was these emanated from the architects because they, in fact, replicated sort of the column order that you find in buildings. Then came a variety of scenarios. Uh, the building in a park, OK? That's an object in the landscape. The building under the park, some reserved, quiet little structure that you wouldn't even know it's there, OK? Then there was, there was a facade was going. Then there was the park 
a building, I mean a park on a building, cover it with green. And then lastly, it was the building that subsumes the park. All the activities of the park were housed in the building itself. A few postmodern jokes. And then we had one, probably the only interesting new concept, and that was a shopping center of a park as a shopping center of activities. A highly structured scheme with aisles of specific activities. It was like, you know, Campbell soup in this aisle. If you wanted to go into, into theater design or, or basketball, you pick your aisle and you'd go do it. Now, the problem with this, though, it never really fully realized its potential. And like a shopping center, it remained a self-contained, isolated entity, not even capable of relating to its own elements, let alone the environment that it was in. Now, for all of this, the professional skills that were demonstrated in the plan is really quite high. <coughs> But there was virtually a non-existent ability to deal with what was the fundamental problem, which was the redefinition of urban recreational space, or better yet, the redefinition of how contemporary society deals with its leisure time. Okay. So to tr the ability to track and understand the sort of the socio-cultural -so shifts of the past century and to find the reciprocal response in urban morphology. In this case, it's open space, okay? Now these should have been the issues that, have, that would provoke the fresh and provocative images that are the reflections and the physical manifestation of what we call contemporary life. So here we are, like a man in, at this competition in the dark hallway with a single light bulb. And someone, he's on the floor scratching around and someone says to him, uh, what, what did you lose? He said, a key. And they said, where did you lose it? And he points to the dark corner. He said, well, why are you looking here? He says, because this is where the light is. And I possibly, I think within this competition, which is a reflection of the profession, that's why I use it, <clears throat> we are looking only where the light is. People not, may not be, in fact, uh, not attending the or coming to the 20th century or 19th century parks because they're archaic, but rather because there are more compelling places to be. Today's parks may have to come to people. They can't be isolated or may not be isolated experiences separated from the city. It's conceivable that parks have to become an integral part of the urban fabric, a system of maybe hierarchical spaces and forms that directly relate to the activities that are in fact adjacent or within the reasonable distance of it. It may be erroneous to think of parks as only linked to city, for the city and the park may be inseparable with no lines of definition, no remedial tenuous ties, but rather a fusion of both. That doesn't, that one that does not rely on the artificiality of massive pyramidal forms or uh, crystalline structures or shopping centers and zoos of gar thematic gardens as attracting a constituency. But that's Disneyland, and it's appropriate, but it does not represent an integral part of urban life. Now, the urban park may embody all of the above, but it's still a part, as I said, of, our, of everyday life. And it becomes a stage, a stage that provides the opportunity for social contact and bonding which is slowly eroding within our urban environments. So how can Villette be the expression of the 21st century when we haven't found the 20th century yet? And by the way, we have 20 more years to do this. So there's still time. Villette actually turns out to be one of many spaces. Uh, we are our, because today what we're doing is we're experiencing a closer relationship between where we live, we work, we learn, we play and we carry out our daily life. No one park or one open space or one form can fulfill all the needs of these ur changing urban lifestyles. I suspect what I'm really trying to convey to you is an understanding of the systemic aspect of urban life and the responsive reciprocal forms and facilities that, that a, Villette, a place like Villette might in fact be. And attempting to look in the dark corner may in fact provide the contemporary environment or urban environment. And it's not a retreat from the harsh reality of urban life, but rather a celebration of urbanity, of what we've created, not one that rejects the 19th century form alone. Because for in an urban and pluralistic society, 
the broadest range of opportunities and experiences are really requisite. Urbanism is really a celebration of diversity and integration, a series of overlays of integrated systems that combine to make for our social, economic, physical, and even political entity. These are the forces that in fact create our cities. Now the contemporary park or the park of the 21st century will have to evoke and share an image that is rich and as persistent as the 19th century form. It can't be conceived as an isolated fragment part of the whole without understanding of, of the whole. That sort of reminds me of those the, the three Buddhists, and I can only remember what one did, who were feeling, these blind Buddhists who were feeling the, an elephant and they felt the four legs and they, one of them obviously concluded that this was a structure on columns, you know, and without understanding what the rest of this animal was. So, getting back to the challenge. And one challenge is, and I say this reluctantly because I really don't want to sound pompous, but it's to look outside of the limits of the site for the answer. And I think that is one of the fundamental flaws of this competition. You had to look at Paris, Parisians, the lifestyles, and so forth. Now the other, who is to be the author? And maybe there's really no need for an author, a single author. But I'm really curious, you know, when this degrading sort of destructive dispute for territory between the landscape architect, the architect, and the artist really began. And I also question what has brought us beside a distraction from what the real issue is. For within the city, like it or not, we really must come together because we're inextricably entwined as professionals. And I suggest that there is a fundamental interdependence and again, like it or not. And in a time when we're less specialized, a single author might have been appropriate. But however, the complexity, the diversity, the richness, not to mention the changeability of contemporary societies, suggest that various disciplines you know, must contribute and get rid of their divergent interests in the interest of providing a, an environment that fulfills the human potentiality, one that brings all living uh, uh, forms together in a, in a coherent manner, botanical as well as human, and that the, the physical environment represents a place where this all occurs. Now, culture defines itself by what it builds. All great cultures express their attitudes towards nature in the design of their open spaces, their gardens, their parks, their plazas. Now, Villette, for all I've said, will produce a competent design, but I suspect that it will not be one that expands the vision and the experience of contemporary life. And that sort of implies that we really need to go further in our explanation, explorations. And in order to do so, it's essential first to look outside the boundaries, and it's essential for the designers of the environment, all of them, to come together, pooling collective experience in this search. And with rare, rare exceptions, I mean, I really don't want to exclude the, you know, where the creative process provides an intuitive leap, you know, an exponential change. You know, exclusive of that, we really cannot work independently. So for me, Villette was an opportunity to look at the profession under a microscope and to realize that without change, we really can't produce a vision, or we can't realize a vision that will bring people together in an urban environment, you know, in a manner that evokes the same imagery and the same values that we got from the 19th century form. And it's diversity that we should be looking for and coherence. What I'd like to do is take a few minutes of your time uh, and show you some of the projects that I've worked on, which embody many of the faults that I've mentioned in this, in, this, in this remarks. But they also sort of give clues, just by watching how people use it, they give clues of where we might be going. At least they're a basis for, for, for some consideration. And with lights and camera, and the, I lost the other. Oh, we have the lights.
Modern technology, I keep talking about modern technology, we've not yet received instructions as to how to deal with it. Oh, that's good, thanks. I wish we could see the slideshow, maybe we can do it later. See, see, we haven't moved into the scientific world yet on a practical basis. Uh, the next speaker, unfortunately, is or perhaps fortunately, is having had an operation and it's work, it's coming along and Romulo Jurgler is doing well, as I understand it. He has uh, sent in a, 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 a document which he has written and I'm going to ask that that document be printed and made a part of the record of this uh, seminar and distributed in the program or in the, uh, in the published works. Uh, I think it's better that, since we have live characters here on the stage, that we won't uh, go through his talk uh, by reading it from somebody else. We'll leave that to him. He's a remarkable man. If you read about him, uh, it's interesting that he was born in Italy and moved to the top of the profession here in a dramatic way. Now, in introducing the next speaker, I'm uh, moved to, uh, to a memory of considering the next two speakers. Uh, I'm inclined to reminisce about the, the last trip I made to, to England on the Concord. I'd never been on the Concord before. I never could afford it. This time it was free, so I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> and. Uh, I got on this cigar-shaped plane, had a delicious lunch, and in three hours and 15 minutes, without any real sensation of moving in any way, I had reached the London airport. It was an experience that I'd never had before. It was a moving experience. To me, it, is, it was a demonstration, in fact, of the space age. That is our next speaker. I think that Amory Lovins, Amory Lovins, whom I've never heard speak, is, uh, is the man that, uh, that uh, I've heard so much about. And I think that the last words uh, in his introduction, saying that he's, he's interested in the relationship between energy, water, agriculture, security, and economics suggests that at the age of something like 31 or two, he's already been across that ocean in three hours and 15 minutes every day of his life. 
So I, I feel that he, and he, he represents something very important for you, and I give him to you with the same interest that I hope you have, Mr. Levins. Thank you. The physicist Niels Bohr once said that it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. But one thing I think we can say with fair confidence, uh, even in, in my mid-30s, <laughs> is that designers are going to have to pay careful attention to energy. That's not going to go away. But that's going to require a loose-leaf mind because energy technologies are evolving with dizzying speed. And they're not always evolving in the direction that conventional wisdom said they would. You may remember <clears throat> over the past 10 years there have been various incarnations of President Nixon's Project Independence. Uh, we were supposed to have <clears throat> another trillion dollars worth of power plants by the turn of the century, a huge synthetic fuels industry, lots of Arctic and offshore oil and gas, coal mines all over the place. And yet, in practice, the landscape is littered with the wreckage of mega projects of these kinds, which are dying of an incurable attack of market forces. Meanwhile, however, <clears throat> a different kind of energy development is oozing up through the cracks, all but unnoticed because it doesn't show in the federal statistics. And I can summarize in a couple of simple statements the real energy revolution that's happened in this country, especially since 79, one which will have profound implications for all the design sciences. First of all, in the past three or four years, this country has gotten more than 100 times as much new energy from savings as from all expansions of energy supply put together. That is, millions of individual actions in the marketplace, people weatherizing buildings, plugging steam leaks in factories, getting more efficient cars, and so on, have together given us <clears throat> over 100 times as many additional BTUs as all of the new oil and gas wells, coal mines, and power plants built in the same period. Even though those things got something like six times as much investment and 10 or 20 times as much subsidy. You may remember only a few years ago Many well-informed people were saying that energy and GNP marched forever in lockstep. <clears throat> and yet today, <clears throat> our national product is oh, close to uh, a quarter grosser than it was 10 years ago, and yet we're using less energy now than we were then. The second remarkable development since 79 is that we have had more new energy from renewable sources than from any or all of the non-renewables. That is, we've had more new energy from sun, wind, water, and wood than from oil, gas, coal, and uranium, or any of them. So, for example, we're now approaching our millionth solar building, most of which are passive. You may remember that uh, a few years ago, the federal government was saying that you could only use passive solar techniques on specially designed new buildings, perhaps like the one we'll be dedicating today. But hundreds of thousands of people didn't know that, so they put up their greenhouses and trom walls on existing buildings, <clears throat> and they now bask in their sun space in February, munching fresh tomatoes and reflecting on the infirmities of government. Uh, <clears throat> we, <clears throat> we are getting today about twice as much energy delivered from wood as from nuclear power, which had a head start of 30 years and $40 billion in direct federal subsidies. I'm not saying that to advocate wood burning, which is often not done in a sensible way, but rather just to point out that it's faster to do lots of small, simple things that are accessible to everybody than to do a few big, complicated things that cost billions of dollars and take 10 years. We're, we've actually had more new electric generating capacity ordered since 79 from small hydro plants and wind power than from coal or nuclear power plants or both, without even counting their cancellations. And you can even pick some rather odd examples. In southern Humboldt County, for example, in, so in uh, the Redwood country of California, an estimated 80, 80 percent of all the households have cut loose from the electric grid and switched to solar cells. Thousands of them have done this. 
why are they putting in these manifestly uneconomic solar cells? Well, it turns out they're growing special crops and they don't like meter readers coming around, so that changes the economics. <coughs> uh, <coughs> now, the, I think this, this technological revolution uh, is going to go a great deal further and faster than it has already. And the future it's leading us to is not one of austerity or privation or penury. Quite the contrary, it isn't even the sort of future of redefining the questions we ask, although some of that will go on. I know a, fr a Japanese friend of ours was asked why he didn't heat his house. He said, why should I? Is the house cold? <laughs> uh, <coughs> but I, I think what we're heading for instead <coughs> uh, is a future of insulating the roof rather than freezing in the dark two ways of saving energy which are quite different, although often confused. We're heading for energy supplies, uh, renewable supplies, which are more reliable and more affordable than the ones we have right now. And the new energy technologies are not putting new constraints on designers, but rather new degrees of freedom, offering new opportunities to do things we've never been able to do before. For example, we're building a structure in the Colorado Rockies right now, <coughs> which has commercially available uh, glazings. It happens to be argon-filled heat mirror windows. And they're good for a bit better than R5. That is, they'll let less than a fifth as much heat through as a standard single pane of glass. But they look just like ordinary glazings. Highly cost effective. And you have to get down to at least minus 20 outside before there's any condensation on them. Well, that's, that, that efficiency of glazing is getting into the range in which you can heat your house say, in this sort of a climate, with a north-facing window or greenhouse. You'll get enough diffuse skylight without needing any direct beam radiation. And there are experimental glazings that run upwards of R19, which will increase uh, how, how easy it is to do that sort of thing. I remember uh, about eight years ago, a distinguished group of engineers who deal with mechanical systems in buildings put forward a proposed uh, energy-saving building code, ASHRAE 9075. One of the problems with it turned out to be that it assumed windows were a net heat loss regardless of which way they pointed. And this had the effect of outlawing passive solar energy as it was then understood, meaning large areas of south glazing. Then it turned out, however, <coughs> that there were lots of recipes for making super insulated buildings which would need less than a tenth as much heat as standard ones in the first place. So you wouldn't need extra south glazing, just the ordinary amount would suffice. And just about the time states got around to correcting this building code uh, so as to allow lots of south glazing, they discovered they didn't need it after all. Meanwhile, however, many places had passed zoning regulations saying that buildings ought to be in, oriented in new developments basically facing east-west so they'd have a big south area. Since then, we've discovered that the orientation and aspect ratio of the building hardly matter at all. You can have a completely passively heated building that faces or is, is aligned north-south. And now as we get into new glazing systems which let you heat with north-facing glazings and forget about what happens on the south side, uh, again, all the rules have changed. So any building uh, no matter how well thought out, is likely to be technically obsolete before the mortar is dry. And anything written about energy technologies is obsolete before the ink is dry. Sorry, it's a fact of life. It uh, means we're going to have to be a lot more adaptive. And there are some new technologies coming along which offer amazing design opportunities. I was thinking of that air-inflated structure you described. Uh, there are <coughs> materials now in experimental stages which, for example, are transparent until they get up to a preset temperature, at which point they turn a brilliantly opaque white. And as soon as they cool down through the preset temperature, they clear up again. Now, if you combine that with very efficient glazing materials, you can have a structure which would simply sit there as a dome and regulate its internal temperature to 70 degrees or whatever else you like, regardless of what's happening outside and it would do so all on its own. And it could regulate its own lighting and its own ventilation completely passively. Now, the new technologies for saving energy have made perhaps the most dramatic progress and the hardest to keep up with. We have today, for example, <coughs> cost-effective technologies which can double the practical energy efficiency of industrial motors and their drivetrains. 
more than replacing every reactor in the country, or double the efficiency of jet aircraft, or treble that of steel mills, quadruple that of household appliances so your electric bill would be less than a quarter of what it is now for the same jobs done. In fact, the best refrigerator now in prototype uses only a 27th as much energy as the national average, and yet otherwise it's indistinguishable. It costs a little more, but you get that back in the first few years. Our office in Colorado is lit by some new Philips light bulbs, which give more than four times as much light per unit of electricity as these lights. Uh, it's light actually of better quality. It's indistinguishable from daylight. It's a new kind of fluorescent bulb whose phosphors are tuned to the red, green, and blue retinal cones. So you can't tell it from daylight, and because it runs at very high frequency, there's no flicker or hum. The bulb also lasts 10 times as long as a standard bulb. It retails for about $25, but you get that back in a year or two from your electricity savings. <clears throat> Volkswagen two years ago tested an advanced diesel rabbit that did 80 miles a gallon city and 100 highway without pulling out anywhere near all of the technical stops. <clears throat> and the best new buildings use only a tenth or a hundredth as much, as much space conditioning energy as buildings that were standard just a few years ago. There are, for example, about a dozen recipes for super insulated houses which uh, use typically a few percent as much space conditioning energy as a standard house. They'll have, in this climate, probably R40 walls, R60 ceiling, R3 and up glazing. Uh, they'll have a tight vapor barrier. They'll be very well insulated, so you'll get lots of, excuse me, very well ventilated, so you'll get lots of fresh air. But the ventilation will come through a gadget called an air-to-air -air heat exchanger, which recovers 80% of the heat or cool in the outgoing air. And it's quite straightforward now to make buildings so energy efficient that it hardly matters whether you heat and cool them or not. A friend of ours, for example, lives in a super insulated trailer, and uh, if he happens to get a little cool on a cold winter night, he plays with his hound dog and the extra heat from the excitement of the dog heats his trailer. A very cold night is a <laughs> ten stick night. <clears throat> uh, in fact, uh, it's, these sorts of buildings you could perfectly well heat by burning junk mail in a number ten can. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, by thinking warm thoughts. <laughs> and these kinds of buildings have profound implications, obviously, for how, if at all, one heats them. For example, there's a builder we ran into in Oregon who decided to put his money where his mouth is, so when he goes into the market to sell his super-insulated houses, he says, as part of the purchase price, for the first three years you own the house, you simply send him all the utility bills and he'll pay them. It's a great deal. It only costs him 100 bucks a year, but it sells him a lot of houses. Uh, there, there, there are important interactions between the efficiency of the building and the design of its space conditioning systems. For example, if you make a super insulated building that is so heat tight that the heat just rattles around inside and can hardly get out, then you can heat it, for example, with one little uninsulated piece of hot water pipe anywhere in the house. You don't need a heat distribution system. There aren't any drafts or cold spots in such a house because there aren't any heat sinks. And in such a house, suppose, for example, you've put up a solar water heating system, which, if done right, is quite cost effective by itself. Well, in order to make it a little bit bigger so it also covers the tiny residual space heating load, the extra cost you have to pay for that oversizing of the solar water heating system is so small that it's less than the capital cost of a good gas furnace or wood stove. That is, in such an efficient house, completely solar heating is cheaper than partly solar heating because the storage costs less than the backup would cost. Or suppose you take a super insulated house and you heat it by putting a little greenhouse on the south. Well. The next thing you could do is put some big fins or some other fairly simple passive system in the top of the greenhouse where it can never freeze and use that as your solar water heater. But because it can't freeze, you don't need to go through double loops and antifreeze and heat exchangers and drain down valves and all the things which make outdoor solar water heaters complicated and expensive. So there's a vital synergism between building efficiency, passive design, and active design, if any, <laughs> which would be completely missed if you just considered technology separately. And the next great integration that we're starting to discover is between systems that provide shelter and those that provide 
food and water. The structure we're building in Colorado, for example, uh, has right in the middle of it a 900 square foot jungle, which should provide most of our fruits, veggies, and fish year round, and also make it a very beautiful space, and we will commute 50 feet to work across the jungle. Now, the opportunities nationally for using energy in a way that saves money are really staggering. For example, if GNP were to increase by two-thirds over the next 20 years, which is really pretty ambitious, but if we also used energy in an economically efficient way, we would get to the turn of the century using a quarter less energy and a quarter less electricity than we use now, cutting our use of non-renewable fuels nearly in half. And this would save the country upwards of two trillion of today's dollars in energy facilities we wouldn't have to build and in fuels we could leave in the ground where they couldn't get into mischief. That means, in turn, that instead of being inflationary, the energy sector would become deflationary, a net exporter of several trillion dollars back into the capital marketplace, where it would be available for other purposes, like, say, running universities, along with something of the order of a million jobs to go with it. There's been equally striking progress in opportunities to use renewable energy which turns out to be not cheap, but cheaper than not doing it, cheaper than the power plants, in fuel plants, and so on, which we would otherwise have to build to do the same jobs. And in every country so far studied, it's turned out that the best presently effective, uh, cost-effective and presently available renewable sources are enough to meet essentially all of our long-term energy needs. Countries we thought were poor in energy, like Japan, are poor in fuels, but it turns out they're very rich in renewable energy. And we used to think that, let's say, solar energy might work in the suburbs and in the countryside, but wouldn't work in the cities. We now find that urban density actually improves solar economics. There are technologies becoming available now which we hadn't even dreamed of. We now know, for example, how to collect high temperature solar heat on a cloudy winter day in Stockholm. The most dramatic progress, though, is still to come, and it's in solar cells making electricity directly from sunlight in one step. We are not very far from having architectural glass, which makes electricity, as well as letting light and heat through in controlled amounts. The glass, incidentally, could also have an optical density controlled by a small voltage put across it, so you could lighten and darken the glass according to what the weather was doing and how much heat you wanted. You could also, incidentally, uh, instead of putting a photovoltaic coating on the glass, you could also put uh, a certain dye inside it, which will fluoresce. And the light from the fluorescence bounces around inside the glass and bounces off three silvered edges onto a fourth edge on which you put a solar cell, whose uh, band gap happens to be matched to the fluorescence peak of the dye, so it's very efficient in making electricity. Uh, if General Electric succeeds in what it's trying to do, you will fairly shortly be able to buy photovoltaic shingles, and you will uh, <coughs> make the electrical connection by nailing them onto the roof. Uh, <coughs> there are a lot of clever things going on in photovoltaics, and we feel one way or another it will be fairly common by the end of this decade for houses and other buildings to be net exporters of electricity. In which case, bye-bye utilities. Now, one of the things we're going to have to learn to cope with is profound changes in the structure and form, the, the purpose even, of, our, of many of our institutions brought about by these new energy technologies. Utilities have big problems anyway. They are generally insolvent in all but name because they've been liquidating themselves to build power plants that they don't need, can't afford, and will never be able to pay for. Uh, but I think the utilities are starting to discover that they're not at all in the business they thought they were in, namely selling kilowatt hours. Raw kilowatt hours are not a useful commodity, just as you don't want to buy barrels of sticky, stinky black goo. Uh, what you're after when you buy, say, electricity or oil is not the energy per se, but the service it provides. Comfort, light, ability to run amplifiers, ability to make steel, run sewing machines, bake bread. I think it's reasonable to suppose that people will gradually move towards the cheapest way of providing the energy services they want. 
We are developing an increasingly free market in energy services, one in which people can choose the amount and type and source of energy that will do each task in the cheapest way. But that means, for example, <coughs> that utilities are even worse off than we thought. Because you can buy enough electrical efficiency at under one and a half cents a kilowatt hour to more than, quind quind uh, more than quadruple the efficiency with which we're using electricity. It is to be able to run the country very nicely using less than a quarter as much electricity as we do now. Which you could do with present big hydro, a bit of small hydro, a bit of wind power. If you wanted to, you could throw in some solar cells or industrial cogeneration, but that would be it. At least 80% of the electricity now sold, maybe closer to 90%, is uncompetitive with efficiency improvements. And the more utilities raise the rates to pay for new plants, the more uncompetitive their product becomes. So trying to bail out utilities by raising their rates is kind of like trying to bail out Chrysler by raising its sticker prices. That doesn't help Chrysler compete with Honda, and it doesn't help electricity compete with weather stripping, which is a very tough competitor. In the long run, under this kind of competition, utilities are going to turn into something kind of like the telephone company. They'll be mainly a distribution and bookkeeping operation, <coughs> mediating between many dispersed users and many mainly dispersed sources. But they also have a choice, meanwhile, between participation and obsolescence. <coughs> Rather than ignoring the competing energy technologies, the ones that all the clever designers are coming up with, rather than hoping these things will just go away, utilities could help finance them. Utilities with over half the capacity in the country, for example, are now giving loans to help their customers do the cheaper things first, like fix up their buildings. And there are ways of structuring those loans which completely relieve the capital burden on the consumer and still make the utility much better off, reducing by anywhere up to a hundredfold the amount of investment capital that the utility requires. Again, that's part of the two trillion odd dollar saving from doing a least cost energy strategy. We are gradually reallocating our capital so that in 1980 alone, Americans spent $15 billion on efficiency and renewables. Lots more to come. You ain't seen nothing yet. We have barely scratched the surface of how much energy efficiency is technically available and economically worth buying. And it isn't just utilities that are, that are going to change profoundly through this kind of economic competition. Many other familiar institutions and structures are going to change too. I think, for example, we're going to see our cities become a great deal greener than they are now. Uh, my wife and colleague Hunter was much involved with urban forestry in Los Angeles, which turns out to be not just a wonderful tool for environmental education and community organizing, but a way to make our cities a great deal more livable. We're seeing urban forests sprout now in the wastelands of the South Bronx. We're noticing that a good-sized urban tree, just from its transpiration cooling, is equivalent in cooling power to something like a dozen room-sized air conditioners. <coughs> and not only would more trees make our cities a much nicer place to live, they'd also make the city much more self-reliant in liquid fuels for transportation. Los Angeles County alone, for example, sends to landfill every day four to 8,000 tons of pure separated tree material, not even counting mixed truckloads. That's about 1,000 megawatts thermal being thrown away, and it could make sustainable liquid fuels. We're also going to see a lot more indoor farming, integrating food and water systems right into our structures in a way that makes them a lot more livable and beautiful. Three quarters of the oil and gas supplies to the eastern states in one evening without even leaving Louisiana. The electric grids are even more fragile than that. And we documented recent attacks on centralized complex energy systems in 26 states and 40 foreign countries. They're happening about once a week. Not to mention simply technical accidents and natural disasters that are making our energy supply less and less secure. And yet, if we did what's cheapest, if we had a more efficient, diverse, dispersed renewable energy system, it could become so resilient that major failures would simply become impossible. The economics are very impressive. In Holyoke, Massachusetts, for example, in 65, the city power engineer happened to <coughs> see the Northeast blackout rolling towards him. By thinking fast, he was able to cut the city loose from the collapsing grid fire up a gas turbine they had instead, and 
by not having to black out the city, the money they saved paid off the cost of building that power plant in four hours. I think for this very simple reason of not wanting to be turned off, we're going to see a shift towards a lot more dispersed, decentralized energy system, which turns out to be the cheapest thing to do anyway, and it can make our energy supplies more reliable in routine operation. People have even a stronger incentive <clears throat> to become more self-reliant in energy in their own buildings and their own communities, and that is that 80 or 90 percent of the money they spend on energy typically goes away, out of the community, and they never see it again. It may be going to Algeria to pay for natural gas, it may go to Texas or Oklahoma to pay for oil, but it's a drain out of your community, a drain which in towns of typical Indiana size is quite often equivalent to the total payroll of the 10 or 12 biggest employers in town, just to pay for energy. And that's going to get worse. It is that notion of stopping the economic hemorrhage <clears throat> that has turned many communities towards greater energy self-reliance. We had a striking example just south of us in Colorado in the San Luis Valley, an area about the size of Delaware. It's very cold. It's 8,000 feet high. And the traditional Hispanic community there had always gotten its energy by cutting firewood on its commons land from the old Spanish land grant days. When a corporate landowner came in, bought the land, and started shooting at people who tried to cut wood. So they had an instant energy crisis. But they were too poor to buy wood or any other kind of fuel. Fortunately, Arnie and Maria Valdez and a few other people there knew how to build very cheap solar greenhouses out of scrounged materials. And they went around giving workshops and barn raisings until a lot of people knew how to build these things. They're now going up at the rate of about one a day. There are thousands of them. They have solar trailers, a solar post office, a solar mortuary. Baskin and Robbins got into the act with a high-tech solar system on the ice cream parlor. Now the farmers are putting up wind machines for power and pumping. They're just finishing their third alcohol fuel plant run on cold potatoes and barley washings with solar or geothermal process heat. There's a complete energy revolution going on there because people were too poor to do anything else. Valerie Pope Ludlam in the black community in Colton near San Bernardino, California, uh, and several other welfare mothers uh, bootstrapped a small CETA grant into what is now a multi-million dollar a year business in which their own kids make and install energy saving and solar equipment on houses in the black community and they therefore keep all the jobs. The jobs do not go out to the aerospace company. Fairfield, California uh, lost out on a bid for a semiconductor plant when their utility wouldn't guarantee the power and they got so irked about that that they've set up a municipal wind utility. It happens to be a windy place. There are something like 17 municipal solar and conservation utilities in California and Fairfield is even encouraging some of the 60 odd manufacturers of wind machines to come locate there. These are the new industries that are really going to make it in the market. And whether in poor communities like the San Luis Valley or in affluent communities like Davis, California, where people are going to urban agriculture, energy efficient solar design just to improve quality of life, uh, this energy revolution is going to continue because it's happening from the bottom up, not from the top down. Washington will be the last to know. We're finding out <coughs> as the Jeffersonians and the market economists have been trying to tell us for a long time, that most people are really pretty smart and given incentive and opportunity can go a long way towards solving their own problem. The kind of leadership we need in that enterprise and the type I hope many of you will provide is something we should have known about because Lao Tzu told us about two and a half thousand years ago when he said leaders are best when people scarcely know they exist not so good when people obey and acclaim them, worst when people despise them. Fail to honor people, they fail to honor you. But of good leaders who talk little, when their work is done, their task fulfilled, the people will all say, we did this ourselves. Thank you very much. to hear all that energy applauding uh, Amory Lovins, and I hope that you'll have lots of questions about this because it's a subject that affects all of us and everything we do in our, all phases of architecture, all phases of human life. Uh, I certainly have some ideas I want to discuss. For example, 
Uh, he didn't mention anything about long underwear and bundling. Those are two energy. <laughs> uh, I don't want to hurt uh, Kevin Lynch's feelings because it's a great compliment the way I have planned it, but it doesn't sound very much like one now. But uh, when I mentioned uh, this trip, Kevin Lynch, in our profession, is one of those people that if I wanted to know the most about the cities in the most wonderful way, and the most human way, in the most precise way, I'd go to him, his books, uh, The View from the Road, uh, things that are absolutely classics. And uh, listen to him carefully, go back and read his books, and then try to listen to him again. I give you the really warm friend and a great, a great man, Kevin Lynch. Thank you, Ned. I, I too was very much moved by Stonehenge when I saw, first saw it. I, I must, however, disabuse man. I didn't build it. It's not my work. I might also have a story for. Paul, not so much for the audience, uh, we, some years ago we had a Polish professor come to give us a talk and who couldn't speak English, only one or two words, but he had a whole set of slides, wonderful set of slides, and his whole talk was based on that. He spent the, set, showed maybe the first two slides, and the second, third slide came in upside down. and. Uh, he, in his broken English, he asked the person who was running the machine if he would fix it for him. The man said, sure, I'll fix it. He turned the whole machine upside down. <laughs> All the slides came down on the floor in a great heap. The Polish professor had lost his slides. He couldn't speak the language. He burst into tears. <laughs> I must say, you did much better. You stood up very well. And I think your message does, too. I mean, I, I, it's something I'm going to agree with. Um, you know, the. The uh, schools of environmental design in this country, or urban design, or whatever you want to call them, are in great trouble. It's a time of great turbulence. Um, well, Amory Lovins has talked about some of it, the technical turbulence that is happening, where we no, no sooner make rules for something, we find the rules are just exactly wrong. Uh, he's, we're, as a matter of fact, just rewriting a book on site planning. And I find now that once you take out sewers and all the other utilities and the utility connections, I'm going to have to throw away half that book. It's uh, no good anymore. But, uh, so it, it's a time of great technical turbulence, but even more, of course, more important to which you just alluded at the end is really the, the social turbulence, the, the social changes that are happening. They're much more profound, I think, than any amount of heat-saving glass and so on, although it's terribly important. Um, the field of environmental design is further caught because it's, it sits between a number of, of professions which themselves are, are changing. Architecture is having a terrible identity crisis. Uh, planning doesn't quite know whether it's, it's, it deals with politics and economics and policy or whether it still deals with zoning and land use planning or where in the world it deals with. Uh, uh, landscape architecture is growing up fast from just garden design, but as uh, uh, Paul says, has its uh, hang-ups with the 19th century and the romantic park idea and so on. All of these professions are in flux, and environmental design tends to sit in the middle of them, uh, caught between. It's a marginal uh, occupation. It doesn't, in the, most of the schools, uh, doesn't have the institutional base either within the school or outside the school. It's uncertain where its graduates can get jobs and so on. Um, it's, a, it's a field in difficulty. 
And it's true, I think, also of the profession. I don't know whether Paul would agree with me, but uh, the, uh, the people who are doing it are relatively few in this country. The jobs are even fewer and scattered. The competition is fierce. Um, the, the field has tended to go from one kind of specialty to another, from urban renewal to new towns. That was all a thing. Then after new towns, uh, we had the historic districts and waterfronts and downtown malls. And the field goes from one up to another of um, special, some often very large scale, and somewhat remote from the user. Uh, I think it, it lacks an intellectual center. It lacks a sense of uh, strong aims, uh, of what its subject matter is, and so on. I'm really not myself very much worried about the question of where should it fit with the other professions, or is it a profession in itself? I'm more concerned about what is it you want to do, what are you trying to do, what do you work with? Um, I, to me, of course, it has a center, at least the environmental design that I'm interested in. It's, um, it's essentially, it's a passion for place, for places and the activities associated with place, and how that interacts with the everyday life of people, how they sense it, how they work, how they act in it, uh, what it means to them, how they see it, um, uh, how it stands in the way of what they're trying to do or supports what they're trying to do, and so on. There's a very definite point of view involved there. Um, and that um, it, it's not big architecture, nor is it, as I think some schools, schools are trying to uh, train people, sort of an encyclopedia of the professions where you know a little politics and a little sociology and a little psychology and a little bit of building and a little engineering and somehow put them all together. Uh, it really has a center. Uh, it, it looks on the um, city as a place where you realize yourself, where you realize your connection to community and that you're part of it. And uh, you feel the connections, you feel the connections with space and with time, uh, feel the connection with the social community. It's a common possession. It's not a matter of showcase of buildings or, or of specialties, but uh, something that's common to all the community. I, uh, to talk about that, I thought maybe the, the best way would be to uh, review, a, in, in a very brief time, review a book that hasn't even been published yet, and maybe never will, although I hope it will. And it's a draft manuscript written by a man named Donald Appleyard. I don't know if, how many of you know Donald Appleyard. Some of you do. If you don't, you ought to find out about him. Uh, he's a teacher of, uh, I would say, the prototype environmental designer teaching in the University of California at Berkeley. A great man, I think, who um, at his death, by ironically, he was killed. He was a man who was um, spending most of his time worrying about safety, traffic safety in the local streets. That is, how to save the lives of people from these uh, careening cars. And he was killed in Athens by a car going about 100 miles an hour on the wrong side of the street that just landed right on top of him. Um, but he left a uh, unfinished manuscript, which he was working on, on the symbolism of the environment. And I think um, it was developing a new point of view and was really pointing at the heart of what this profession should be. He was um, talking of the environment as a social symbol, that is, saying that uh, uh, professionals tend to desymbolize the environment. They tend to try to abstract it from all of the meanings and fears and hopes that the people who actually use it have. People, ordinary people and, and uh, all people, in fact, tend to look on places as being yours or mine or symbolizes this or it's a relation of power or uh, it's a place of fear or it's a place of love and joy or whatever, it has a meaning for them. It connects to their own life. Uh, professionals again and again, and uh, as I suspect some of the professionals in the slides we didn't see of uh, La Villette Park, uh, tend to abstract some of those that's feeling from it or to, to put in a very uh, abstract kind of feeling of their own, which connects with their own professional concerns rather than with the, the actual lives of the people that live there. And that uh, it's this uh, desymbolization that often means that professionals run up against, as Donald would say, strike on the iceberg of social symbolism. They don't realize what they're doing. He talked in that book um, a great deal about uh, identity formation. In fact, that's really, in some ways, the, sense, the central part of the book, that 
it's known, uh, and we know from the work of Erickson and so on, that the feeling of personal identity, the question of who am I, who do I connect to, what am I part of, what's my nature, where am I going, uh, what am I doing here, those are fundamental questions for any human being. You have to construct a coherent sense of self and purpose uh, in order to be a complete human being. And that construction of self is something that is an interchange between the individual and the group of people that he's living with and contact with, who suggest to project roles on him and he projects a role back and so on and gradually builds an image of himself, a sense of identity. Um, Donald asserts in this book that the environment plays a fundamental role in that. In, in the support of identity and the building of identity that your home and your locality are important ways in which you get a sense of who you are and a sense of personal stability and connection. And uh, uh, therefore, some of the fierce defense that, defenses that people make against changes in their environment because they indeed are an intrusion on yourself an attack on your personality. Um, and he, in this draft, follows that through with many examples, talking about the, uh, what I might call the environmental wars, the battles that have been fought over environmental issues, where uh, much of the misunderstanding and much of the bumbling of the professionals is due to the fact they don't understand how important these places are to people, that they're far more than just functional questions or questions of money. Um, they, they are indeed questions uh, of themselves. Um, and he speaks in there, um, incidentally, of which I think is interesting, of two, two ideas, two ways in which you establish identity and, and confirm yourself. Uh, he contrasts what he calls wholeness and totality. That is, the whole person or the person who has a sense of wholeness has an internal coherence that is all his, his ideas and his hopes and his sense of the world, his picture of the world, is connected inside. And it's firmly connected so that he doesn't have to worry about defense but can accept new ideas so that we can hear, I can hear, for example, that half my book on site planning is going to be obsolete next year and it doesn't really destroy me as quite as a person, uh, although it's very upsetting to my publisher, I'm sure. But uh, uh, that that's one kind of, of sense of identity. And the other, the totality, where in, in lack of that internal coherence, you draw a sharp boundary around yourself. And you say, this is me and this is not me. And that's the way I, I defend myself, by drawing a sharp boundary. A thing that happens, incidentally, in the professions all the time, and I think is very much happening right now in freshman of architecture, that for despair of its, uh, of its identity and its role in the world, is pretending to make very sharp distinctions about what's architecture and what's not architecture. Um, but I could have mentioned other the planning profession as well has some of those same troubles. Donald talks about that in the, um, the way in which communities in their environment either have to make sharp distinctions and exclude others or can accept the stranger and still feel themselves. He's, he's very much interested in what he calls the public life. That is the, the sense of community, the sense of, um, of being able to accept and learn from strangers and not be threatened by them and to accept changes and not be threatened by change. Uh, <clears throat> he therefore speaks a lot about the whole business of tourism, which I don't think there's time to go into here, but a very interesting phenomenon in the world is the immense growth of tourism and what that means for the way people look at themselves and the kind of environment we build, uh, both, both good and bad. In, in one sense, it's a great education. More and more people are traveling, seeing other kinds of life, uh, seeing other environments, learning about other possibilities. At the same time, with that great uh, flow of people, of people who have only a superficial knowledge of a place, the environment and the activities in it tend to be shifted to give them sort of an instant gratification, to give them an instant sense of where they are. And therefore, you get um, uh, fake symbols, uh, s symbols which are put up just temporarily in order to give the tourist a sense that they've got a good picture, that they can say, I was there, and there's me right next to the uh, forbidden city in Peking, and I'm right in front of it. Uh, all of the things which uh, tend to st stage, put, in, uh, put life on a stage so that the uh, instant visitor can see it. Um, 
And yet, uh, as Donald says, as, this, as the world gets more complex and more mobile, more and more people must depend on the symbolism in the environment to, con to convey to them who's here, who lives here, what do they do, what's their nature, what's their culture, and so on. So that we have to learn ways of communicating to people, to strangers, uh, uh, what is happening. In other, and they have to be authentic ways. There has to be real, by authenticity, means the connection between the external appearance and the internal structure of a place. And he speaks a great deal about that. Uh, he also talks of the fact that the environment is essentially an embodiment of the struggle for power and how their, their centralization of power in our society uh, becoming maybe more centralized. And here's the place where I think I particularly um, sympathize with what Amory Lovins has to say. Uh, because I think that the centralization of the power in our society is one of the great dangers, far beyond whether it's efficient or not. It might even be efficient for all I know, but it's uh, uh, far more dangerous for other reasons. Um, <clears throat> Donald in his, his manuscript talks about that. He talks about authoritarian places, open places, places that welcome strangers, places that shut them out. And he gives lots of examples of the battles, uh, battles for People's Park in Berkeley, the battles over um, uh, pedestri pedestrians and motorists where the attempts have been made to slow cars down in the streets and where the motorists fight back and how symbols are used in that process and I would have lots of experiences of my own of seeing that symbolic use. So <coughs> I particularly remember in uh, working in Anacostia in a poor black uh, neighborhood where the question was setting up historic guidelines the great battle was over shutters. I never realized how important a symbol a shutter is. And the historic preservation people kept saying, we cannot allow shutters on these houses. Shutters are inauthentic. That is, they didn't go with the original style of what these buildings were built. And the people kept answering, we want shutters. That's what symbolizes to us a house, a comfort. This, we have just gained our first house. And at last, we've got a place in society and by God, we're going to have shutters. And uh, a whole, I remember a whole day's battle between citizens and preservation people over that symbolic issue. Uh, seemingly trivial, but by no means so. It even got to the point, I remember, where the, uh, when the preservation uh, experts explained in great detail why these particular houses never had shutters. Uh, one of the men in the back of the room got up and he said, I've looked into the background of my house, I found some of the early drawings, and they had shutters on it. And the answer to that of the expert was, well, then the builder was wrong. Um, <clears throat> um, so that, that Donald ends up, in, and I think I would end too, I, I, I'm making a great botch of, of um, summarizing what's a very rich manuscript, an unfinished manuscript. But he ends up by saying that the, the Good city, in a way, is one which is uh, rooted and authentic. He means by rooted that what you see and what's there is directly connected with the actual people and the activities that are there, that there's an authentic connection between appearance and uh, inner reality, then therefore it's distinctive. That, and it's well fitted to what actually people are doing. That it's uh, diverse and accessible to the public, that it's accessible to strangers. You can have an open public life and yet without uh, threatening the uh, distinctive authenticity of the place, that it's cared for and controlled, controlled not in the sense of, of a big centralized power, but a dispersed containment of power, uh, that uh, the users are in control of the place that they live in. And of course, that it's equitable, that there's a just distribution of uh, goods and values between um, all the people who are in it. Of course, that's far from the reality of our own day. Um, now there, there are tremendous obstacles to this and this is I think one reason why the, the field of environmental design that I'm interested in has its difficulties which, are, which go far beyond the professional difficulties which I think are immediate obstacles but not the fundamental ones. Uh, of course the, the fact that in our society there is power is inequitably distributed. I mean, There's no question about that and that's fundamental. Uh, changing that will, will take a long time. Social changes are occurring, but they occur slowly. Um, and of course, I must say, the, 
the terrible threat over the environment that hangs over any of us with the nuclear holocaust. But um, there are some particular, more particular obstacles to this. One being that I think we have no effective institutions which are responsible for the way in which uh, the environment affects the everyday life of people, the quality of the environment. Uh, um, we have effective institutions which can um, uh, build profitable developments, and sometimes they have good qualities and sometimes not. But there's no, no set of effective institutions that's concerned about the quality of the environment, and those must be built. Uh, and certainly we have very little uh, participation in the whole process of development and maintenance by the people who are actually concerned, the people who actually use it, and that must be built. Uh, on the other hand, you've got, a, you've got a deep and underlying popular interest. You have a constituency uh, which is very widespread and which does, isn't going away. By all of the evidence, it's still there and, and growing stronger. And there is, um, there is an upsurge of community organization. The communities are yet, um, I would say, ineffective and have very little power, but that organization is growing, and I think, to me, the most hopeful base for uh, environmental design is the local community organization in this country. Also, the, the possibility that the idea of conservation, that many of these conservation ideas may come together in a single force. Not only the energy conservation that Amory speaks of, but historical conservation, e ecological conservation, and I would say conservation of communities, the, the, the saving and, and repair of the social community. If that group can ever get together, then we have an effective, really effective base. That's, that's the most hopeful uh, uh, thing. It's, it's, um, it's conservation in a broader sense. It's defense, not incidentally, not in the defense of the Department of Aggression that we are more familiar with. It's euphemistically called the Department of Defense, but defense of, of the common life. So I would just say that I think that um, uh, the schools have uh, a hard row to play, that it's not going to be easy for them. They, they have to survive. They have to try to build, help build those institutions, those community institutions that will defend the environment. Um, they have to find ways of increasing the participation of people in the decisions that are made in the way that your own urban design studio is doing, which I think is doing a splendid job. Um, that the students who come out may have some disappointments. They'll find that uh, many of the jobs that are available to them don't lead this way, and they have to exploit the cracks in the system to, uh, to uh, make a world that's more open, that's more public, that's more authentic, rooted, all of those things. Uh, it's, it's not going to be easy. I, I still am a long-run optimist. I think it's coming. I think that if we aren't destroyed by a nuclear blast, God help us, uh, I think the communities are building in this country and the environment, the concern with the whole environment and the way it affects people's lives is building and, and will continue to build. Thank you. I'd like to uh say a few words uh, somewhere between uh, being the moderator and, and the architectural slot that Jurgula was, unfortunately, isn't here to fill, personally. Uh, I'd, I'd like to mention the fact that, and then we'll have a coffee break, and then, uh, like a commercial in one of these uh, newscasts, I'll promise you excitement, thrills, danger, and controversy after the coffee break. So please come back. Um, the, my favorite, uh, in fact, uh, I kind of like to almost want it on my tombstone, was what, uh, what uh, Louis Sullivan said about he believed that children, the child's uh, instincts were the most basic power in the world and that the intellect was what killed it. And that's what I believe. I believe that all the things we're talking about here today can only be accomplished through the childlike faith in the emotional possibility, the instincts, 
towards doing these things. And if we think about it too much, if we let our peers in the uh, failed industrial revolution pour cold water on it and start being intellectual with us, they'll kill it. Now, I believe also that there's nothing that we can use and need in this country that hasn't already, doesn't exist right now in the soil, in the land, in the air, in the sea, in the water. I believe that all the devices, the nasty little things that they cook up, that are made of plastic that break down like the roastered in here in the cafeteria this morning, all those things that you learn to depend on if you'd brought your own uh, food, you'd been all right. I believe that we should get back, we should look towards those historical things. Actually, heritage can be a religion or can be sterility, it's up to you. But, uh, for example, in New Mexico, where I live part of the time, in the winter time, we curl up on the south side of our adobe wall and are cool uh, and are warm. In the summertime, we curl up on the north side and in the shade, we're cool and pleasant. We can doze off every afternoon on either side in either season and time marches on in a very slow pace. But the energy has been around for a long time. And if you look at the pink cheeks of an Englishman, you know that part of that came from the fact that he didn't have too much heating. He didn't have too much of the so-called comforts. And if you study any society, you'll find that the only time they're really worth anything was when they were struggling, when they were moving up. And the Americans particularly have to have a crusade. They can't do anything on a legal or an intellectual basis. If an American sees a law, his first instinct is to break it. The only thing that he enjoys more than breaking it is to have a crusade that makes no sense. We've got to have a crusade, the Ten Commandments, in the environment. Now, I believe that on the one hand today, we're at a great, we're in, a, I think, the most important period we've ever been in since in, in the, in the, since the uh, ice age, when, they, when the glaciers withdrew from the North American climate. I think we're in real trouble, and I think we've got to face it. And I think the architects, as, a, as the whole architect, used in the term that God uh, was the architect of the universe, or that, or that uh, Thomas Jefferson was the architect of the, independent, uh, the Declaration of Independence, used in its broadest sense, we have a tremendous niche to fill, and if we don't fill it, the thing won't work. If we do fill it, it will work. We have, on the one hand, the industrial revolution, the industrial people who are, as I say, dying out. They're failing. The ind the, there is no dependability in the industrial world. You don't know whether that hot point iron plant is going to be in that town for another 30 years or when they're going to move it somewhere else. You have no credibility, they have no credibility. They are the ones who make the decisions on the basis of what they call efficiency or, an, or economic soundness. On the other hand, you have David Brower and the Friends of the Earth or, or the Sierra Club or the, or, or the defense, uh, environmental defense. You have a whole body of devoted, gung-ho guys right, way out there in, in left field. There is nobody that crosses the lines, that gets into the middle. We, they, both sides need an interpreter. That is our job. As a whole architect, this can be done. I can give you three examples. One of them, Kevin and I were very much involved in Baltimore, the queen city of our, west, of our east coast. That city would be as chopped up as Gary, Indiana today if we hadn't, on an environmental basis, spent four years and seven million dollars of government money to see that nothing happened. The great success of our... <laughs> the great success, in most cases, our, our cities were laid out naturally, 
Our environment was laid out, handled naturally. The great success in most cases is to, do, is to keep people from doing anything because if they do it, it's going to be wrong. And this is a great job for the environmentalists. And the environmentalist has got to be us. And it has got to be the full architect in all sense. It's got to be Paul, it's got to be Kevin, it's got to be Lovins. It's got, we've got to merge into that wonderful force of the crusade. We've got to have a children's crusade. And it should start in the dark recesses of the great universities where they conspire against all things that are bad and come up with great things and have great vision and go out and do them. And it should start in the smallest town, the smallest village. Take Indiana. This was the terminal of the National Road. L'Enfant actually was great, very much influ influential on the city of Indianapolis as a plan. You have some of the wealthiest people in the world here and some of the most benign forms of plants. This is really a marvelous place. They're doing a partial job here. They could do much more. So my plea is the environment is the heart and core of all of us. And the energy that is that we get individually from Dancing in the plaza, that's another way to keep warm. That's what the Hopi does. The energy that you use in making your own little backyard a wonderful place multiplied by this trillion, which I don't even know what a million is, let alone a billion, but whatever those numbers are, that's what comes from getting together, working as units at the source. Our country is agrarian. It's basically agrarian. I believe that if we really went to work on this, we'd get right back, and I'll finish with this one idea. Down in Big Sur, where we have been successful in actually keeping 72 miles of that country almost entirely untouched, and mostly by never letting them have more than a two-lane country road where they should have a freeway, they think. But my neighbor next door, is listed as one of the 12 richest men in the United States. When he comes down there with his wife, he has us over for lunch often. Last time was a couple of weeks ago on Sunday. He was, he'd just come in from his little garden that he had planted and he was peeling the carrots so that we could have fresh carrots as an hors d'oeuvre. They had cooked, everything they cooked there, he had raised personally in his garden. He was casting a Pelton wheel from bronze castings that he'd made from the wax molds right there in his backyard. We were, he was going to use, he is going to use his stream and he's not one of the men that really need to be relieved of the PG&E bills, but he's going to use that stream to get all of his electric power. Now that man, with all his money, with all his fame, loves nothing so much as the simple little things that each and every one of us have right here in the middle of Indiana. Don't forget that. That money is nothing. Money is meaningless. Money is useless. It's a burden. It's a curse. It's the things that you use, that you touch, that you feel, and we all have that power. So that's what I want to send you out on to have this cup of coffee, and, when, and I hope that the machine that grinds the coffee doesn't break down, and we'll come back in 10 minutes and have a good, big, strong discussion. <laughs> First, I want to uh, uh, read you a, a few words from a, uh, from a document that came out in the Indianapolis Magazine 
dated February 1983, at Irvington, a planned community. There exists an Indianapolis suburb where no liquor stores are allowed. There is an Indianapolis suburb where the street is scrupulously named after literary and scholarly figures and species of trees. The oldest borough in any American city extends its 125 foot limb spread over an Indianapolis suburb. <coughs> These special communities are one of the same. Irvington. The town's roots go back to 1820. John Wilson arrived in Connorville about that time, and he decided to uh, settle in the east half of Irvington in 1822. He went ahead and built this subdivision. And nobody was allowed to interfere. No road could, any, could be uh, was allowed to be put anywhere where it would interfere with the tree. There are over 40 species of trees that are now. And there are over 100 species of birds. This particular subdivision in Irvington ended up being a part of Butler University, I believe, before they moved. And generations ahead of his time, Julian and Johnson went on ecological, ecological step further. Trees had right away on the roads and sidewalks they decreed. They had to curve around significant trees near paths and sidewalks. And the important point, and I hope somebody will get that, and I believe I've got a few of these to leave in the library. The important point in this is this suburb, this subdivision today is economically very much more valuable than any of those that have been built later where they didn't go to the desert for farming and farm metals. And I'll, I'll start by asking uh, Paul Freeberg, I think you have a question. Could you uh, read it and answer the slide? No, no, the question. Who would like to see the slide? Well, that's <laughs> accelerate the scrapping of automobiles and their replacement by efficient cars is rather than uh, subsidizing synthetic fuel plants, it would be a better deal to give you a free 40 plus mile a gallon car provided that you would scrap your Petro Pig and get it forever off the road so nobody would ever drive it again. <coughs> that is, provide a death certificate that has been duly recycled and get your free efficient car in exchange, or it would be worth paying you several hundred dollars for every mile per gallon by which your new car improves on your old car which you scrap. Uh, and the, the opportunity to retool the auto industry to make efficient cars promptly instead of waiting 30 years to get there is exactly equivalent economically to finding under Detroit the biggest supergiant oil field in Saudi Arabia, over five million barrels a day at under uh, three bucks a barrel. It, it seems to me the real lesson, though, in our energy opportunities is that they offer us a breathing space to decide what kinds of industries and what kind of society we want. 
The conventional wisdom is that the smokestack industries uh, will have to go away because we can't afford the energy they use. The new opportunities we have, though, for raising energy productivity and for harnessing renewable sources really turn that into a cocked hat. We can have any kind of industrial structure we want without energies being a significant constraint if we really make the best buys. We have to decide on other grounds what kinds of uh, future we want and what kinds of social problems we would prefer to have. Uh, if, if we want to, we can have a heavy industrial economy. If we want to, we can have a high-tech computer-based society. Assuming these kinds of things work on social grounds, and those are the questions we really ought to be addressing. The last part of the question is, uh, what can we do to convince government that changes are necessary? Why well, try to convince the government? Uh, the real action in energy policy is not at a federal level. A lot of it isn't even at a state level. It's at an individual and municipal and county level. That's where the institutional barriers are. That's where all of the local quirks and unique features of a culture are, uh, the, the, which provide the context in which people make energy decisions. And that is why I said the energy problem is being solved from the bottom up. The problem isn't where do we get 70 quadrillion BTUs a year to run the country. The problem is the cracks around my window. This is a very big country. It's very diverse. <coughs> Fortunately, our diversity is one of our greatest strengths. And in that kind of a problem, central management is much more part of the problem than part of the solution. I think Kevin was dead right about the importance of community vitality uh, in making energy or anything else uh, work right. So our choices of goals of what is worth doing with our energy and with our, our human talents, uh, those are choices most responsibly made at a local political level. Don't worry about energy, uh, just organize in your community to uh, make the most efficient energy choices for that community, uh, and the government will catch up 50 years later. Is there anybody in the audience that wants to follow up on that question? If not, we'll go to you. Oh, uh, yeah. Give your name. Stand up, please, if you can. Find your coat. Thank you. Gestures. What about the lending agencies, banks, et cetera, in relationship to this energy uh, efficiency, energy role? Is that an area you can address? What is the role and status of the financing agencies? Uh, they vary widely, and just as no utilities are alike, <clears throat> there's 3,000 different ones, so there are no two banks alike. Uh, we see some very encouraging signs where some bankers are starting to realize where their financial interests lie. In Seattle, for some years, there's been a bank which will give you a break on your mortgage interest rate if you have an efficient house or car, because that will improve your cash flow and make it less likely that you'll default on your mortgage payments. Uh, there are some very innovative kinds of financing available from certain banks for making efficiency improvements. And there are a lot of third-party entrepreneurs financing shared savings schemes where the enormous financial benefits of improving your energy efficiency can be split among a number of actors so they're all better off and they all have an incentive to make it work. One of the most encouraging things we've heard lately uh, comes again from the San Luis Valley in Colorado. The banks there a few years ago would not give loans on solar houses. It was weird, they didn't know about it. Today, those same banks are reluctant, we're told, to loan on non-solar buildings because they've gotten tired of foreclosing on buildings that are such energy hogs nobody can afford to live there. That's obviously bad for business. So I, I think the, at least in that case, the transition to realizing what makes economic sense has occurred with astonishing speed. And bankers really have the financial vitality of their own communities at heart, too. And for that reason, some are becoming very interested in schemes that will keep the money and the jobs and the economic multipliers in a given community, keep the money circulating there, rather than going out to buy energy from elsewhere. Thank you. Now, we're, next is Kevin. There was another question there. <coughs> well. All right. There are presently several tax uh, programs that encourage this type of local uh, 
against you. Gafford, uh, can you comment on whether these tax credits are stable or if they are under fire presently? Refer to the individual tax credit, the uh, uh, research credit, and uh, the business energy credit. There are some substantial tax subsidies for certain kinds of efficiency and renewable investments. They were introduced in the hope of providing market parity, that is, equal subsidies to hard and soft technologies, if you like, and to efficiency and new supply, so that they could all compete with equal uh, subsidy. It would make a lot more economic sense, of course, to remove all subsidies to the energy system and let things compete on their economic merits. I hope, but doubt, that I'll live to see that. Uh, the people who have the subsidies for conventional supply want to keep them, and they're very big. For example, 64% uh, of the capital cost of a new reactor is socialized through tax subsidies. Now, the tax credits to solar energy in particular are under heavy fire, and there have been repeated efforts in Washington and at a state level to do away with them or to write the rules so restrictively that they don't do any good. I think the tax credits have introduced some distortions in design. Uh, people are tending to build greenhouses in crazy ways to try to get the tax credit within the Baroque rules the IRS wrote. Uh, the tax credits are, in some cases, being captured as extra rent by solar installers, so systems are costing several times as much as they should. And in some, well, uh, in general, there's, there's a distortion in favor of activists against passive systems and supply as against efficiency. So those are all going in the wrong direction. On the other hand, since we have the subsidies, pulling them at this point would probably collapse a fledgling industry which offers a lot of good things, and unless we're prepared to pull the hard technology subsidies at the same time, there's a fat chance of that. I think we ought to keep the uh, solar tax credits we've got. Okay. I'd like to, I just want to comment on that in a different way, uh, because of, of the sort of uh, situation in environmental design. The, the government, in order to uh, stimulate uh, more efficient transportation system downtown, I think it's through UNCTA, one of the other agencies, began to provide a vast amount of money for redeveloping your downtowns and the bias was malls, okay? So all of a sudden we saw like a disease cropping up all over the country, malls. Why? Because there was money, not because there was a need, and this was a direct, in every case, but because you had the money, you had to do it. It's like, why? Because it's there. It's the idea of Everest. And one of the problems with any of these government subsidies is the, is the tendency to make it a blanket subsidy without evaluating what the implications are before the subsidy. I can go back without prolonging this to the model cities days, where it was doomed to failure by the very design of the system to dump that kind of money into communities that had and give them the power without the administrative capability, you know, almost was a pre doom situation. And I think in politically, uh, you know, politically oriented towards that end, that we'll show them. They want the power, screw them. We'll show them, give the money, waste it, do what you want with it, and then we'll come back and we'll criticize. Now, Kevin is going to have the next question, and uh, Will you please pick the most interesting one of those three first? Oh, I can not necessarily. Um, uh, pick first one that um, maybe it will be partly answered by Paul as well as myself. It's, um, tell us of the jobs or commissions in America today. I assume it's made in the field of environmental design. Um, why are 38 firms, including yours, uh, applying in Kalamazoo? Is it for the $50,000 fee or what? <laughs> Uh, and the matter of fact is that uh, not only our firm, but also Paul are, are applying in that, so we're both uh, engaged. Let me say, uh, I think Paul can answer it partly, but let me say something even embarrassing at the first. I didn't even know that we were applying in Kalamazoo, which is probably true. I learned that just yesterday from Paul. Uh, it, shows <laughs> it shows what to what degree I'm involved in the firm in, in the early applications. But let me say something in, maybe in more general about the kinds of commissions, the atmosphere in which you work. Um, jobs like this, uh, that is working with the 
total the piece of the fabric of the city are relatively rare uh, in this country, considering the size of the country. They are very much, as Paul just said, uh, predicated on the kind of governmental funds that are available at that moment. So there are rashes of them. The downtown malls, as he said, has been a hot item. Uh, waterfronts also. Before that, the un urban renewal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, a firm is therefore that wants to do this kind of work is uh, inevitably at the mercy or.